So good afternoon and welcome everyone to this uh, one hour webinar uh, going through ARENA's funding and the safeguard mechanism. Uh, we've got some really exciting speakers for you today to take you through and make sure you're all up to date update on these issues. My name is Jared Luke and I'm the CEO for the Australian Alliance for Energy Productivity. And I'd like to start this webinar uh, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. And uh, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and into the future. For those of you that are new to A2EP, we're a non-for-profit organisation with a focus on energy productivity. And we're funded by this lovely broad set of members who share our vision to improve energy productivity. Uh, we uh, do this by connecting people with the world's best practices. Uh, we are exploring for new technologies and we're advocating for good policies and programs. And so with that, we have these members and our general broad community all there to improve uh, energy productivity and decarbonisation. Today's webinar will be recorded and we'll be sending out those uh, slides and the recording to uh, those people that registered over some more time in the next week or so. Uh, after each of our presentations today, we'll be having a, a Q&A session. So uh, if you'd like to hold those questions to the end there, let's do that and you'll be able to uh, we'll have plenty of time, I think, for those uh, the Q&A session. Uh, meanwhile, feel free to have a bit of a chat on the sidebar uh, there as we go along. Uh, feel free to do so. So our first speaker today is from Arena, uh, Peter Henke, who is the Manager for Business Development and Transactions. Uh, Peter has a very long history within uh, the energy world, uh, doing uh, many years at the likes of energetics and uh, what have you, and, and spent quite a few years now with Arena, helping them to roll out different projects and programs. Uh, Peter has been working on the IETS program, who's going to take us through that one today. Um, and, uh, and and of course, many programs before that gives us a lot of confidence uh, uh, with having Peter steering such a program, uh, given his history and knowledge of different technologies and, and options and, and, and energy itself. So that's it's great to have Peter steering that one. Our uh, second speaker today is Patrick Pacey from the Federal Government's Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water. And uh, Patrick is part of the uh, Safeguard Mechanism Task Force, and he's going to be taking us through that in the second part of our webinar today. Uh, but to start with, I'd like to ask uh, Peter, could you start sharing your screen? And we'll uh, we'll start with your presentation and take us through what's happening with Arena and the uh, IETS and other programs that are coming up there. Thanks very much, Jared. And hopefully I'll get my screen coming up. Are you seeing that? Yes, I can. Excellent. That's great. All right. Thanks very much. Great to be with you. Uh, look, let me just do a quick time check. How how long have I got for this, Prezo, Jared? I think uh, uh, 20 minutes or so. We'll get through the 15, Perfect. 20, but uh, uh, the shorter you are, the more questions I'm sure we'll have. Simple as yeah. that. No worries. Okay, I just want to start off by acknowledging um, Jared's acknowledgement um, of country on, on the Kemeragal um, people's land here uh, on the northern um, north, north side of uh, Sydney. Uh, and I pay my respect to elders past, uh, present and emerging of both this country uh, and, and all around the, the lands uh, that everybody's from. And of course, uh, pay that uh, respect to any members of the Indigenous community that may be with us today. Okay, I just um, very quickly, um, I think probably everybody on the, the call was well aware of ARENA, but just by way of a quick um, snapshot, um, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, ARENA, established back in 2012, um, and we're seeking to assist the global transition to net zero by accelerating the pace of um, uptake of pre-commercial technology and innovation to the benefit of, of Australia. We've, uh, as I say, been doing that since uh, 2012. Um, I think the slide's just a tad out of date now. I think we might have just ticked over 2 billion um, invested across that time. 
across uh, something north of 600 odd projects uh, scattered right the way across the, the country, across a whole range of technologies. Um, and as you can see, we've been um, you know, operating across uh, all, all states and territories. So ARENA um, operates to a set of strategic priorities which get refreshed and updated uh, periodically um, by our board. We, uh, ARENA is an independent agency, independent of, um, of government. We are a government agency, but our, our board uh, sets our direction and our priorities. Um, and so currently our priorities, uh, as shown on the screen there, um, which are to optimise transition to renewable electricity, commercialising clean hydrogen, supporting the transition to low emission metals and decarbonising land transport. So those four priorities set uh, the direction and the um, where the bulk of our base funding um, goes. Uh, but as it says at the bottom of the, the screen there, we not only deliver on those strategic priorities, but also deliver uh, budget programs. So just um, a little bit of explanation about the way ARENA is funded and works. We receive a base funding allocation from the government, um, which is then uh, delivered uh, through um, those strategic priorities, as I, as I said, that the, the board sets. Uh, but then the government periodically can also decide to allocate additional monies through their um, regular budget process. Uh, and then sometimes they will ask ARENA to uh, deliver some of those programs. Um, and so we have quite a number of those additional programs underway at the moment. So this um, page is, is a little bit busy, but that's because <laughs> we're pretty busy. Um, so up in the top left corner, you can see our, our base funding programs, which are um, the Advancing Renewables program. Some of you might be aware of that program. It's been around since 2012. It's our, our always open program and our mainstay program. Um, and alongside that, we also have an innovation fund, um, which we run in combination with the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. Uh, it's a little bit like a, uh, a, an investment um, fund. So those, those two um, are really focused around the uh, strategic priorities that I just mentioned on the, on the previous page, those four areas of st strategic priorities. Then in addition to that, um, the government has asked us to run the other programs that are shown on the screen there. And the ones obviously of most interest to this uh, cohort, I think, uh, are the industrial programs. So that's the Industrial Energy Transformation Studies Program, or IETS, that Jared mentioned at the beginning, uh, which kicked off towards the end of last year and is, is currently open. Uh, and then we have uh, the one in orange, which is not yet open, but in development, um, which is um, the Powering the Regions Industrial Transformation Stream. This was something that was announced just in the most recent budget uh, by the government um, and uh, currently in development, as I say. Then we've got a range of other programs um, dealing with microgrids, batteries, um, transport. Um, we've got a couple of R&D programs focusing around iron and steel and hydrogen. Um, and then we've got uh, a hydrogen head start program, which is all about uh, you know, getting getting Australia kick started uh, on that uh, developing a, a hydrogen super economy type uh, outcome. So that's just uh, our programs at a snapshot. Obviously, the green ones are the ones that are open at the moment. Uh, the orange ones are currently in development. Uh, and I'll just give a little bit of um, intro into the ones that are, of, uh, I think, of most relevance to the to the group that we've got here today. Um, so, firstly, the Advancing Renewables Program, as I say, it's it's always open, um, has been open since 2012, and not going anywhere. Um, it's a merit-based program. What that means is it's not open just for a set period of time, um, where everybody has to come in and. Um, compete against everybody else in one assessment process. It's open all the time so that each application that's received is assessed on its merits. Um, it's typically a two-stage assessment process, expression of interest, followed by a, a full application. It's generally um, pretty mostly, pretty much um, focused around project deployment. We do sometimes um, have a, a Kind of a, an early or an earlier stage of um, of study uh, bolted onto a, a 
project deployment, um, but it's really uh, all about um, deploying projects and, and getting projects out in the market. Um, it's typically about a six to eight month process. Um, it varies quite a lot depending on um, just uh, simplicity or complexity of both the project um, <clears throat> and the assessment process, but it's it's of that order. Um, and you can see on the, the right there, I've called out a number of items that um, really help guide how we think about investing in uh, these um, these projects, and and, uh, and and it's really around um, innovation. Is is what's being proposed uh, innovative? Is is it something new, or have we seen lots of these things before? Um, commercialization is there a pathway to commercialization really uh, a key element of what we look at uh, arena is very keen to as i said beginning accelerate um, the uptake of um, of pre-commercial technologies so that means by definition the things we're seeing in our applications are not commercial today but we really want to understand the pathway to how they will become commercial um, and what role arena's funding might play in helping them get to that point <clears throat> And then last but not least is uh, knowledge sharing, really key part of everything that um, ARENA does is uh, incorporating knowledge sharing deliverables uh, into the project. We're all about um, sharing the learnings from projects to bring the, the industry along more, more broadly as again, helping to accelerate the uptake of technologies. And just to be clear, that is not about um, you know, delving into IP and releasing trade secrets and that kind of thing. It is all about sharing your experience of, you know, how you've gone about thinking about this technology, what's brought you to to um, wanting to implement this particular project, what your learnings have been along the way, um, whether they be positive or, or negative, what is it that's going to help the rest of the industry um, uh, replicate or, or build on what you've done to, to leapfrog ahead. So that's the Advancing Renewables Program. Um, now turning briefly to the Industrial Energy Transformation Studies Program. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this was uh, kicked off in um, late last year, actually came out of a, um, a budget um, back in 2020. There's quite a delay between uh, announcement and um, opening for a bunch of reasons I won't go into now, but uh, ultimately we were able to open in um, in September, late September of last year. Uh, it's an allocation of $43 million uh, administered by ARENA um, to support feasibility studies and engineering studies um, that will help accelerate or support uh, an investment decision in energy efficiency and renewable energy solutions for industrial processes. So that's the, the core focus of the, the program. Um, the program is split into two streams. Uh, stream A is for feasibility studies, uh, stream B for engineering or feed studies. Um, stream A, recognising that feasibility studies are typically smaller, faster, cheaper to, to do, um, is a single stage application process. So we've tried to trim down um, that time uh, to, to apply and, and um, get underway. Um, so single stage only, go straight to a full application. Grant sizes are between $100,000 and $500,000. So that's the, the arena contribution, um, which can be no more than 50% um, of the total study cost. Can be less than that, of course. And that's one of the criteria that we do take into account is how much you're uh, actually asking for and whether that represents good value for money. Um, and then uh, for engineering studies, um, recognising, of course, that they're more complex and uh, typically more expensive. Um, it's a two-stage application process, an expression of interest followed by a full application. Um, grant sizes from 250000 up to $5 million. Again, the same comment around the, the maximum grant contribution. <clears throat> so what we're trying to achieve through the IATS uh, program is to deliver a transformational improvement in industrial energy efficiency and or renewable energy use uh, as compared to, to business as usual. And of course, to receive uh, achieve a, a corresponding transformational reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. 
So the, the word transformational there you can see appears multiple times as it does in the in the uh, program heading. It's there very intentionally. We do want to see a transformation in the way the business uses energy and re uses renewable energy. Um, we're not interested in just you know very small scale incremental improvements. We really want to see how we're going to get uh, the business deeply on a pathway towards um, net zero. Um, and finally, they're uh, demonstrating high replicability um, across similar industrial settings, whether that's in the same industrial sector or other sectors that use similar processes. Um, again, which trying to uh, to get some value for money out of demonstrating this particular uh, technology and see how that might um, be replicated elsewhere. Um, there's a few words there. I'm not going to go through all that in detail. A lot of words on the screen, but essentially just um, identifying you know what's involved in a feasibility study and an engineering uh, study. Um, essentially, to put it uh, in in simple terms, I guess feasibility studies, smaller studies, and or earlier stage, um, trying to reach a conclusion about whether it's warranted to progress further um, with investigation, doing a more detailed engineering study on a particular technology or indeed if it's a relatively small uh, scale project then that might be sufficient to to take you straight to an investment decision but importantly it does come after um, the initial scoping study this is not intended to support um, uh, the initial uh, um, optioneering or concept studies saying you know I've got a, a target to reduce emissions. I don't know what to do. Um, the intention is that that work would get done first. And then having done that, you'd say, OK, I've now narrowed in on one or a few um, technologies that I really want to dig into more deeply. And that's where the feasibility study would kick in. And then engineering studies typically follow on from that, particularly for the um, larger, more complex type projects. Um, and and do get you to a point of FID uh, on potentially quite a large scale project. Um, so the timeline um, for a single stage full application is something in the order of um, twelve weeks. Um, so I've I've made week zero there the um, point of assessment, um, and we are assessing applications under this program on a quarterly basis. So it's typically the first week of March, June, September and December. And we've just had one assessment uh, at the beginning of June. Uh, next one will be coming up in, in September. Um, and then working backwards from that, um, we're happy to hear from you um, any any uh, concepts that you may have. If you're saying, I think I've got a project that or a study that would be appropriate under this, we're happy to hear from you at any time. Um, but certainly by about four weeks out of that assessment period, um, we'd be looking to see a pretty <coughs> good draft work plan so that we can really start to come to grips with, OK, what is it that you're planning to do? And that gives us a couple of weeks to um, between us. Um, we provide you some some feedback and say, OK, it's not quite clear to me um, what's happening in A, B or C area. Perhaps it could do with a little bit more uh, emphasis or a little bit more information around area D. Um, and then, you know, we, we might go through that iteration once or twice before you then get to a point of submitting a, a finalised formal submission about um, two weeks out of the assessment. Uh, and then following the assessment, um, we just go through a process of um, finalising the um, recommendations that may come out of of the assessment from our assessment panel. The assessment panel is uh, an independent assessment panel. It's not me or any of my colleagues at ARENA that assess the applications. It's it's independent assessors and, and they provide a recommendation to ARENA, um, which the CEO um, will then act on. Uh, so ultimately it's the CEO's decision to approve or not uh, a uh, any particular application. So that takes you know three or four weeks to, to go through that process um, and then uh, potentially um, another uh, one to two months uh, just to execute a funding agreement. We're working very hard to bring that time down. That's that's sort of based off our experience in the advancing renewables program <clears throat> uh, where we're executing funding agreements on 
sometimes very large scale projects, multi, multi million dollar and multi tens of million dollar projects. These are studies, um, so recognising that we are um, doing a lot of work to bring the um, the negotiation period down on the, the funding agreement. Essentially, that's just getting down on a piece of paper on a on a uh, formal contract what it is that you're going to do, what that study is going to entail, what deliverables you're going to provide, um, and and the funding that will flow at what times. So that's IETS um, very very quickly. Um, Essentially, just www arena um, is where you will find information on that and all of our programs. Uh, so just go to the tab for seek funding, uh, and there you'll find industrial energy transformation studies. Um, and under there, you will find the guidelines of the program, um, a template of the funding agreement, some FAQs, and the whole application process. Uh, and there's an email address there, industrial energy at arena.gov.au um, to um, send any any questions you may have. Really quickly, I'll just touch on um, powering the region's <coughs> industrial transformation stream. Um, this is a new allocation of money that the government made in the most recent budget, um, again to support uh, industrial decarbonisation, this time for the implementation of the projects. So whereas the previous program was supporting studies. This one is supporting implementation of projects. Uh, there's $400 million, which forms part of the $1.9 billion Powering the Regions Fund. Um, so the $400 million is what ARENA has been asked to manage. We're not, we're not managing the $1.9 billion. Um, and the focus of this program is around existing industrial facilities and some new clean energy developments uh, in regional areas. So it's very strongly focused uh, around, around the regions. Um, and there's also a, um, a focus around third party aggregators where the project relates to an eligible industrial facility. So in other words, we, we need to see a clear link to the industrial facility that will be benefiting from, from that activity. So the sort of um, items that are within scope will be likely um, trials, demonstrations and deployments and technologies could be, you know, anything including energy efficiency, electrification, uh, fuel switching, process heat decarbonisation, uh, bioenergy, uh, common user infrastructure that supports that decarbonisation, a whole range of things. Um, and as I say, that program is still in development. So all of this is sort of indicative. This is where um, these are the sort of high level um, framework, I suppose, of what the program is likely to, to be, um, but still still in development. So nothing is um, is in concrete at this point. Um, and important to note that the, the funding is separate to the Powering the Region Fund's um, separate $600 million safeguard transformation stream, which is uh, for safeguard mechanism entities, uh, which will be administered by the Business Grants Hub, so not 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 by ARENA. Um, so as I say, we're still in development on the industrial transformation stream. Um, we expect to open uh, for applications late 2023. Um, it will um, be um, Focus towards NG, NGR reporting facilities, um, and will be delivered over the the four years to 2027. Um, and as I say, we're, we're right in in sort of scoping mode at the moment. We'll be coming out with some consultation in the very near future. Um, and if you would like to get any further updates or consultation on that, you can register at the email address there, which is its at arena gov.au and that's me Jared. Thanks Pete, appreciate the uh, overview. Uh, I understand there's a few technical difficulties for some people getting in today uh, and I saw a lot sort of coming in after five minutes so they may have missed the uh, the uh, presentation going through the uh, ARP. Mm -hmm. uh, the recording and slides of course will be sent out after this so you can catch up on that but generally the, the message that I may have missed there is the ARP uh, the the uh, advancing renewals program still open, focused on innovation, commercialisation, and knowledge sharing, uh, and that's still still available for for grants. There, I think in the past, uh, P 
PD have said that sort of a, a minimum co-funding grant of, of around about half a million to a million dollars. Uh, anything less than that's probably uh, a, a lot of lot of hard work, but uh, uh, somewhere around there for that sort of fund that funding from that one. Yeah, there's um, there's there's not a specified minimum, but I guess it reflects that sort of time frame that I mentioned at the beginning. That it's typically sort of a you know six to eight month type process from first engagement to when you've got a signed agreement. Um, so clearly, you don't want to go through that process for a small amount of money. It needs to be something reasonably substantive. Um, and yeah, look, probably you know um, a few hundred thousand dollars would be minimum sort of size grant. That you'd be looking for, uh, yep. five hundred to to millions, probably a more comfortable size. But it 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 kind of depends, you know. It's it's very much horses for courses, but but yeah. And that certainly has seen funding going towards uh, uh, um, heat pump programs, uh, renewable heating. Uh, certainly a program that A2EP ran. Uh, um, sees things like uh, uh, solar thermal and. Uh, and, and uh, using solar thermal for power as well. I guess that's the sort of has been the focus in the past. Is that uh, that's still yeah, well, that's the, still the case? Well, the focus changes over time. That that was the strategic priorities that I mentioned. So the ARP delivers funding on the strategic priorities, and the board does shift the strategic priorities over time as they see the market evolving and the needs of the market evolving. So what we've funded in the past might not necessarily be what we fund today. So yep. those four. Um, strategic priorities, which again are on, on the website, um, guide um, where that money is is allocated. It's not impossible that funding could go to something outside of those priorities, but it would have to be uh, a you know a very compelling and, and fairly exceptional project to warrant um, getting funding if it sits outside our our current strategic priorities under ARP. Gotcha. The other programs, the IETS and the ITS and the other programs I mentioned, have their own set of guidelines and they're focused around their own specific areas. Excellent. Uh, looking for some questions in the chat. Maybe it was working before. Maybe that's been disabled and what have you. Oh, we've got a, a, a question coming through from Richard. Uh, maybe I'll get Laura to see if we can get Richard to come off uh, mute and, and ask the question. While we're waiting to do that, if I just throw one in there. Um, it, IETS, you said $43 million. Uh, I assume there's uh, uh, a reasonable amount of money still left. Uh, and and uh, um, is that that sort of is it is a main major barrier for people doing this. They want to know that there's a very good chance of, of, of uh, securing the funding. So you're saying there's still a reasonable amount of dollars left. Yep. Uh, um, and every quarter this is open, that sort of thing. How, how are you tracking with in terms of turning those around? Is that is that heading towards that, you know, uh, three months or so after the, the close of the application? Is that that's, yeah, that's up, realistic? Up that order, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Great. Good. Um, Richard, yeah, go, go for it. Want. Thanks, yeah, Jared. Uh, hi, Peter. Richard White from CSR. Um, Peter, I'm sure like a lot of companies on this call, you know, we're, we're looking at a number of, of uh, major projects in our, in our various factories and things. And the projects are often quite complex and do involve a significant energy component where, you know, we could be talking um, perhaps a 20 or 30 percent reduction in, in natural gas, for an example, um, but also potentially um, setting them up for future electrification. So technologies around the world where perhaps electrification has started, but um, you know w w we're not going to be the first in Australia. We never want to be the first um, in in this sort of um, stuff. Um, in general, um, are they the sorts of things that that you believe would be um, eligible, or do you think that's a bit too much business? You know, like you say, transfer you use numbers like trans things like transformational and you know. 50% uh, of the feed and things like that. Do you think that description, you know, so it might be, let's say, who knows, a $50 million project, it might reduce, um, gas might reduce by 20 or 30% of this, you know, large piece of equipment, but there's also civil works and equipment yeah. and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Do we, I have looked at your guidelines, but I suppose, and that was a little while ago, I think they've changed recently. So it's just interested in your comment around that. Um. Yeah, the guidelines haven't changed. Um, okay. There was a, a minor wording update or something, but um, they're substantially the same. Um, yeah, I, I think the sort of project you're talking about sounds conceptually um, 
you know, appropriate and on target. Um, I think the the key thing that we're probably looking for is understanding how that fits. Yeah, you know, what what is your decarbonisation plan and target? What what are you aiming for? And how does the project that you're proposing fit in with that? So I guess the the one thing that we'd be looking for is that we're avoiding you know a, a carbon lock in. We just sort of don't want to uh, do a project or support a project that then locks in another twenty or thirty years of carbon. If your ultimate objective is to move away from that, that would seem inconsistent. So we'd be looking to understand how does what you're doing um, fit in with your long term decarbonisation plans, if that makes sense. I think that does. Uh, thanks, Peter. Yeah. Sorry, thanks, I was on mute, but no, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, before I go to Ross for the next uh, question, just uh, one come through on chat, and I think this one's pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, is it possible to use VEEK benefits along with uh, IETS for the same project? And I think that'd be considered completely separate, and the answer would be yes. Uh, yeah, so just to be clear, the IETS is funding the, the study, and the VEEKs hmm. would be, you know, um, a, a contributor to the project implementation and economics. I would presume I don't think you'll be using VEEKS for the study, is that right? Uh, no, you wouldn't. So that VEEKS is more for the actual implementation. Yeah. Maybe the question is if you had ARP, if you're doing an ARP, could you still yeah. get the VEEKS? Yeah. I think, or, I think or, the, or the newer ITS um, mm. pro program. Um, and the answer, short answer is yes, um, we, we take a holistic view to look at your project um, when we're sort of evaluating what the uh, arena request is and what the arena contribution should be. We look at the economics of the, the project, look at all of the sources of funding, um, and that'll be your own funding that you're putting in. It might be uh, in kind that a supplier or um, a consultant's putting in, or it might be um, Beaks or whatever. What does the whole project look like from an economic perspective? And what's the component of that that ARENA is contributing? And does that make sense? Does that is that what's needed to make the project make sense mm -hmm. from your perspective? Indeed. So that would cover ACUs and things as well. Yeah. So some adjustment there maybe if uh, if one state or territory doesn't have access to higher value VEEKs, then you have to say, yeah, maybe they're going to look at ACUs. Good one. Thank you. Uh, Ross, are you able to come off mute there? And uh, you've got a question. Go for it, Ross. Yeah, uh, Ross Paul Smith from Mondial Advisory. Um, this might come across as maybe a silly question, but it's certainly something we've kind of encountered. Just curious on what the definition of pre commercial technology is, given that our experience is a number of companies, if it's not been heavily used or significantly used in Australia, it's classed as sort of pre commercial, whereas overseas it might be completely commercial, but just in early stages. So, yeah. just where yeah. the definition is. Yeah, not not a silly question at all, and, and I'm glad you raised it because I need to clarify that. Um, <clears throat> that's something that particularly applies to the ARP um, program. So that's yeah, that program does support pre-commercial technologies. It's um, if it's you know if it's commercial and cost-effective to do today, then by definition you don't need grant money to make it happen. Um, the IETS studies program um, is not confined to just considering pre-commercial. Um, so we're looking to support studies that are going to help you get down the path towards implementing projects that the technologies that you implement, implement may or may not be pre-commercial. That doesn't matter. Either way, we're, we're interested in helping you uh, do the study to, to get to that point. Um, and I guess just to elaborate on, on your or to answer your question about, you know, overseas versus here, yet completely understand that there may be technologies that are used um, perhaps widely internationally, but not in Australia. Um, we would still see that as you know potentially innovative and pre-commercial in this country if it's if that's you're doing a first of a kind or that it's been very limited uptake here. Uh, we don't have a, a clear pathway um, to see how that's being deployed in Australia, then potentially you know your project might um, help uh, unlock that in, in Australia. And that's part of what the knowledge sharing is about and understanding that pathway to commercialisation. How would us, how would ARENA helping you in this project help that outcome come about? Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Ross. Uh, a question here on the time frame for the approval. Uh, you, we mentioned just before, it's about uh, three months or so is that target for the 
IETS feasibility. Is that the same for the feed studies as well, or is that uh, is it is it is it a bit longer because they're a bit bit larger and a bit more complicated, no doubt. Well, it's a little bit longer because it's a two stage process rather than one. Um, so we we go to an expression of interest process, which is exactly the same time frame as the full application to get up to the assessment. So we want to see something about a month before the assessment. We'd go through the assessment. The difference then happens after that point. We then don't take it off to the CEO to, to get approval. We then um, would get a, a, um, a recommendation from the assessment. Yes, this is recommended to come back as a full application or no, it's not. So there's a fairly clear cut um, outcome there. And assuming it's recommended to come back for full application, we would then um, have that assessed at full application as soon as the applicant is ready. Um, and I can't give a time frame on that because sometimes the, the assessment might be, this looks like a really great study or project, um, but at full application, I would expect to see A, B, C, D and E. Um, and those things might take five minutes to put together or they might take five months. You know, it kind of depends on the project, um, not not in a study typically, but, um, it, you know, it, it, it is a little bit of a how long's a piece of string, um, depending on what actually is needed to get it to a point where at full application, the assessment um, assessors have got the information they need to be able to say, yeah, I can understand the, the merit of this and uh, yeah. assess likewise. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, Satinda Sani from Asahi, are you there? Can you come off mute? You got a question for Peter? Yeah, hi, hi Peter. Uh, Satinda from Asahi, just uh, taking a confirmation and rechecking the enduring feed studies under IETS. Is it only for study or is it this ultimately grants funding for the implementation of project as well? IETS is for studies only. There's no money for implementation under the IETS program. The forthcoming ITS, I'm sorry about the confusion on acronyms, it's not my choice. Um, uh, the forthcoming ITS program, which is $400 million under the Powering the Regions Fund, is for implementation. Okay, thank you. Um, because the, the study goes up to $5 million, so I thought it's maybe it's implementation as well. Yeah, no, Thanks, that's, okay. that's to accommodate you know, feed studies can can be multi-million dollar exercises, so that's to accommodate those. Thank you so much. Good one. And uh, the, the ITS, uh, Industrial Transformation Stream, Stream, sitting underneath the Powering the Regions Fund, uh, that's still under development. And right. uh, as much as we'd love to know detailed timeframes on that one, Peter, I guess they're just uh, still working that. The consultation, well, what about the consultation? Where, where, where are we at with that one? Yeah, there? look, we expect to be going out with um, some initial consultation um, imminently, um, possibly mm. even next week. It's um, it's pretty close. Um, there's probably be a couple of phases of, of consultation we expect to go through, so be a little bit of time in that. Um, and then we do, we, we have got a sort of a penciled in um, uh, announcement date um, of towards the end of the year, possibly you know around November or something like that. But that's mm. that's to be determined, depending on you know what comes back from consultation and how the process runs from here. But that's the the rough time frame that we're working to at the moment. Good, uh, really good follow on program from the IATS and. Uh, I heard the, the federal government has said it's, it's this uh, next ITS, the 400 million, is considered a down payment. They know that it's not enough, but it, it sounds like there'll be a, a dollars available for, for several years. So this is sounds really promising. Uh, one last quick follow up question just to, to clarify uh, the stage two assessment for IETS then uh, for the June, September, December cycle, or can it be done out of cycle? Yeah, that's the point I was making before. Yes, it yes it is. So it's not held right. to that quarterly. The the in, ex, initial expression of interest is done on that quarterly assessment, and then the follow on full application, the second part of the two stage application process, will be done uh, as required whenever the the applicant is ready with a full application. Excellent. Uh, thanks very much for that, Pete. Uh, uh, you'll stay on the line, and if we've got time at the end of uh, Patrick's presentation, we'll come back and see if there's more questions for you. If that's okay. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. And uh, a few questions in the chat there, and feel free to have a bit of a sidebar chat with uh, with Peter as we go. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Patrick Passy from uh, the federal government's, let's just say DQ, if I may, or DQ, if I may. Patrick's a lot easier. Uh, and uh, uh, going to take us through the safeguard mechanism. Uh, to preface this in discussions with Patrick about this, it does seem that every one of these slides could be a one hour presentation. Uh, so Patrick's done his absolute best to give us a, uh, a helicopter view, but getting ready for, for questions afterwards if you want to take some deep dives in specific areas. So Patrick may whirlwind us through it, but uh, we'll have time for questions for deep dives after that. Patrick, if you'd like to share your screen and go through those slides, that'd be great. Uh, sure do. Thanks, Jared. Let me just. Hopefully that's coming up on screen. And if I go from current slide. Yep, looking good. That, that's coming up and, and now I can no longer see hands up or questions or anything. So if Jared, if you could yell out um, if if anything's happening on the screen. Absolutely. Um, but look, just to start out a little bit about me, I've been in and around this space for quite a few years now. I, I started off this journey I see a few familiar names on, on the list from from this journey. I started off in the Energy Efficiency Opportunities Program from nearly near 15 years ago now. And since since that wound down, I've, I've spent a fair bit of time on the industrial side of the ERF and the energy efficiency side. And since then, I've sort of spent four to five years working on the on the safeguard. So all within the industrial space. And again, I'd like to acknowledge, make an acknowledgement of country. For, for me, I, I'm on Ngunnawal country, so I'd like to really pay my respects to the traditional owners here and um, pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. So as Jared said, this will be a bit of a whirlwind slide, but I really like to start with this slide. I really like this graphic. I've, I've used it literally a dozen times. I think it really sets out clearly for what the safeguard sets out, what the safeguard mechanism covers and what the safeguard mechanism doesn't cover. So we're, for those who weren't aware, these are the, the really large scope one emitters. We cover the emitters facilities with more than 100 emissions of more than 100,000 tonnes per year. So this covers about 28% of Australia's emissions. This is a few years ago now, so numbers are slightly different, but they are pretty similar this year. So, you know, we're at 28%. Grid connected electricity, which is not explicitly covered by the safeguard mechanism, is similar but coming down. So that's on was on 34%. And then you've got 38%, you know, covering small industrials, household, and transport. And you can see, you know, the the, the types of facilities that that safeguard covers. You know, about half of it is coal mining and oil and gas. And then there's sort of 30 odd percent that's heavy industrial. So you're chemical manufacturers, your your steel manufacturers, your cement guys, and then there's, you know, iron ore miners and that kind of thing thrown in as well. So we've been around a little while and I've been working in this space for, for nearly the full time of it. Um, so we've been around since 2016, but we've gone through a few changes in this period. But it is a well-established framework. At, at its fundamental, it hasn't really changed. You know, the safeguard mechanism sets limits. So these are called baselines on the greenhouse gas emissions of covered facilities. So if you go over your baseline, you know, your baseline's a million tonnes, you go, your emissions are 1.1 million tonnes. That's your example A there. And that's where you are, you know, needing to purchase ACUs to cover, to offset the difference. But, you know, it's fair to say that to date, baselines have not been set in a way that, you know, has re has reduced emissions, nor have there been many facilities that have exceeded their baselines in, in each year. So each year we get, we've typically got between the four, five, six, seven, eight facilities each year that exceed their baselines. Most baselines have been set in a way that, you know, their baselines are set significantly higher than their emissions. And that's that example B there. And we, we call that headroom where the facility's baseline has been set significantly higher than, it, than its emissions. But what 
what the incoming government committed to doing last year following the election the election, and this was in a, an election commitment, was to reduce these baselines gradually and predictably and set the safeguard cohort on a pathway to net zero by 2050. So we've been furiously work, working away, not in the background, but pretty much in the foreground, to be honest, um, to develop the reforms. And these were finalised not that long ago, about six weeks ago, the, the primary legislation the final legislation passed and the reforms are due to kick off 1 July, which believe it or not is I think nine days away now. So, you know, it's um, 1 July 2023 got here really quite quickly. So that this graph gives gives you a bit of, bit of a feel for what, you know, declining baselines mean. So, Covered, covered facilities will deliver a proportional share of Australia's 2030 climate target. So the, the bigger picture target is 43% reductions based on 2005. So, you know, the, the decline rates that have been put in place are intended to deliver a proportional share. And what that means is that all of your safeguard facilities in total are looking to emit no more on a net basis than 100 million tonnes by FY30 and zero, and you know, with zero baselines by, by 2050. So you can see from the, you know, from the graph there that the yellow line is the reduction and you can see we've built in what we call a reserve into the decline rate. So the decline rate, the sort of headline decline rate is 4.9%. That's the, the standard decline rate by which you know most baselines will decline and in setting that 4.9 percent we've we've put in a, just a little uncertainty buffer that we're calling a reserve and that uncertainty buffer buffer allows for a little bit higher production than than what we're anticipating so this next slide quickly runs through how baselines will be set in the reformed safeguard mechanism so baselines have been set at least for the since 2019 most baselines have been moving towards being set based on production levels so what that means is that baselines are really set based on an emissions intensity value so your production goes up in a year your baseline goes up proportionally your production goes down in a year your baseline goes down proportionally so baselines are production adjusted and for existing facilities their their emissions intensity level that effectively sets their baseline will start off primarily based on a site specific value so that's a a site a site specific value that essentially represents their current state of that facility and as we move over to 2030 their 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 baseline will be set based on an industry average. So these are existing industry averages that are currently set. You can look them up in the safeguard rule. And you know that industry will transition over time. So through that period, it's a little bit complicated. It's a little bit hard to get your head around. But through that time between 2023 and 2030, baselines will be declining by 4.9%. And the, the, the way that they're set each year will be transitioning from a site specific value to an industry average value. So that's, it's a little bit complex. It takes people a little, little bit of time to get their head around that, but happy to run people through that. And for new facilities with commercial production after 1 July, 2023, they'll have their emissions intensity level, their baseline set based on international best practice, emissions intensity adapted for Australian context. And so these are emissions intensity values that don't exist yet, whereas the industry average do exist. The international best practice values are ones that we're looking to set, you know, over the coming six to 18 months. And, you know, we'll be looking to engage you know, industry and the broader community on, on those values over the next six months. So this slide just goes through a few of the different attributes and the different flexibility compliance type mechanisms that we've, we've built into the reformed safeguard. 
the the first and the kind of an interesting one is that the revised safeguard now involves credits that can be generated where you beat a baseline. So, and this is a really important part of the scheme. This encourages facilities, you know, as kind of a, to put it bluntly, both a carrot and a stick. You know, f facilities are incentivized to reduce their emissions to their baseline and they're incentivized to reduce their emissions below their baseline because in doing so they can receive safeguard mechanism credits. And the SMCs can function much like an ACU does now in the sense that SMCs and ACUs are interchangeable for safeguard compliance and a facility that's over its baseline can use either SMCs or ACUs to, to reconcile or offset their exceedance. And so, as I said, ACUs remain in the safeguard mechanism and that that was a really important policy decision. And, you know, we did come, you know, we did experience a fair bit of pressure from sort of environment, the, the environmental movement to restrict the use of offsets. But we think it's, it was really important to keep offsets in the mix and in the mix in a, in a um, you know, un, unrestricted manner as we recognize that, you know, facilities, are not on a on a linear trajectory. You know, facilities aren't going to reduce their emissions by 4.9 percent each year. You know, their decarb journey will be lumpy. It will be, you know, go in step changes. You know, sometimes that step change will run ahead of a decline rate, and they'll get credits. Other times, a step change might run below, sort of behind the decline. At which point, you know, that they'll need to secure certificates for a period. We also have things like borrowing. So borrowing is a, a slightly quirky thing where you can borrow against your a future baseline, but then you pay it back with interest the following year. And we've also introduced multi-year monitoring periods, which is a different use of that term. So that term has a current usage, but in the future, the multi-year period will be a, a, a mechanism that will allow facilities to exceed in the current period but then offset it in the future. Now I'm conscious of time, so I'll quickly move on to the next slide. So, so going back to Peter's um, presentation before, really, um, in relation to trade exposed facilities. So, I mean, most safeguard facilities are trade exposed. There's only there's only a handful that aren't. But these trade exposed facilities are recognised in the new safeguard reforms. There's a couple of new buckets of money. I think we talked, we touched on the $600 million safeguard transformation stream earlier, which will provide support for decarbonisation projects specifically for trade exposed safeguard facilities. And there's another $400 million. It's kind of confusing because there's two $400 million um, buckets of money, but this is a different $400 million. And this is specifically for industry specific for steel, cement, lime, aluminium and alumina. And finally, for trade exposed facilities that are experiencing a significant cost impact from the scheme, we're looking to offer reduced decline rates where they can demonstrate that the cost impact is above particular thresholds. So I'll stop um, screening, sharing my screen now. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, and, uh, I appreciate that could have got very complicated very in detail very quickly, but thank you for the overview. Well done. I uh, wanted to start with the, the first uh, uh, quick question here. At the timing when you're going to, people are going to be uh, measuring those um, those emissions and what have you, is it going to be continuous monitor monitoring or is it via a single point measurement? We've got a comment here that previously in the power station that was somewhat uh, gamed because uh, yeah, they knew it was going to happen, that measurement was going to happen at a certain point in time. Uh, how are those emissions going to be um, measured? I think the question is probably referring to the, the exist the sort of current emissions intensity level. Is that, mm. I think that's referring to that. So essentially that that's a, a five year historical period ending in FY22. So that's, 
and that removes that gaming aspect. So it's not a, yep. you know, it doesn't include FY23, for example. It doesn't include a future period. It is quite intentionally a historical period to prevent any any sense that people might just, you know, turn the tap on the valve and, you know, let, let rip for a month just to bump up your emissions intensity value. Yep. You know, I, 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 honestly, I really don't feel that, like that this is a significant risk, but it r removes the perception of the risk as much yeah. as anything. Gotcha. Is there any discussion about uh, removing the adjustment for intensity production levels uh, as per SBTI rules? Okay, let me, any... I don't know what the, I'll be up front, I don't know what SBTI rules are and I'm not sure what the question means. I'll be honest, sorry, Paul. Um, and Paul, feel free to come off uh, a mute there uh, and we'll, uh, if you raise your hand, we'll get you off mute and ask the question to clarify that further. Uh, meanwhile, we'll go to the next question there from Mitchell. Uh, is there any indicative timing when the safeguard transformation stream and critical inputs guide application opening will be released? So I'll preempt this by saying it's not my directly my area. The safeguard transformation stream is run out of an adjacent area. They sit about 20 metres away, so it's not a, a big leap. But my mm. understanding is that those, I mean, we're, we're looking to kick off the SDS almost in parallel as, as closely as we can with the 1 July start date. Oh, OK. Very so, you cool. know, Good. so, you know, but potentially I don't know. I haven't heard recently exactly how they're going with that deadline, but that's always been the intention. Yeah. Good one. Uh, Paul, are you there? Have you come up? You're, you're off mute. Uh, just want to clarify yeah, think, that um, SBTI question. I, I think, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. So, so we're part of a global business, but with a big sugar refinery around Australia and our global head office is committed to COP27 um, outcomes and the COP27 and all the rules every year on COP, I think, and Jared, you could probably confirm this, um, we used to, we've always worked on production intense outcomes around our emissions, and that's not not permitted um, if you're going to submit to the COP27 guidelines and measurements around your emissions. There have to be real reductions, not production mm -hmm. adjusted reductions. So I was just concerned, is there any sort of long-term view around how this might work if companies are reporting under both? Look, if I'm, if I'm understanding the, this question correctly, it it's, it's really goes to whether or not there's a sense that in the longer term we might move to a absolute baselines, absolute limits in, in the longer term rather than production adjusted. Mm. And, and the short answer is no. Um, that was certainly weighed up through the reforms process and there was some amount of pressure to from certain sides to move to an absolute baselines but you know it's it, it was it wasn't um you know I, I don't think it was a particularly close thing that we ended up maintaining mm. a production adjusted focus yeah. through the reforms okay okay thanks thanks paul uh, we'll uh, squeeze in one more question before we close off. We've got a question here from uh, Rommel. Uh, do mining and manufacturing companies have the calculation required to determine their safeguard baselines commencing 1st of July? So I, I think, again, that's going to those the determination of those site-specific numbers. And so in order to determine your baseline for the first year, you'll need to all facilities will need to set that site specific number and that is an application process that does go back to those five years of historical data you make that application to the clean energy regulator you know they assess that application you get a determination that sets your site specific number and that site specific number then gets used for those seven years until you've transitioned entirely to the industry average okay. so that those applications are due april April next year, by April. but we, you know we definitely hope that people will get onto it before then. Otherwise, our poor audit community will, you know, will you know won't cope, frankly, if everyone waits till April. Good one. Thanks, uh, Patrick. Well, uh, hopefully that uh, don't get that overwhelmed tidal wave then. Okay, I mean that's, that's uh, pretty close to to our time here. We've uh, that hour's gone very quickly. Uh, 
Peter and, and uh, Patrick, many thanks for your presentations there today. And I think if you left us, uh, Peter, certainly with some emails, uh, addresses to go to for further clarification there. Um, and if people do have some further questions, by all means, email myself and I'll, uh, I'll look to get those uh, answered for you as well. Um, and so now just to, to close off, give you a little bit of a, a rundown of what else is happening within E2EP world. Um, we have a uh, quite a lot of events coming up over the next six months. Uh, the first and the next one we have is coming up on the 13th of July that we're doing in association with the Energy Efficiency Council, uh, looking at industrial heat electrification. What can we do and where can we go? That's going to be done uh, as uh, via a podcast or a recording and, and what have you. So they'll be available as a podcast and uh, as a webinar. And so uh, joining me and uh, will be Rachel Wilkinson from EEC who will, who will uh, uh, chair that meeting along with Dr. Sylvia Matadu uh, from Schneider Electric and Tenet Reed from the um, AI group. Um, after that, we also have a, a, a webinar coming up on the 31st of July. We're going to look at the results of a series of feasibility studies we've done for uh, agricultural and horticultural greenhouses, and we'll be sharing uh, some results on that one and let you know about the, uh, the results and the lessons learned on that one. Uh, we also have a, uh, a uh, webinar on driving the path to net zero, uh, looking at reducing freight transport emissions in the supply chain. Uh, that one's on the 27th of July. And if you go to uh, our website and uh, look at the events page on that one, you'll be able to register for those. So that's the, the three immediate ones we have coming up. We've got a lot more. We've got an exciting announcement uh, to be made next week on, a, on our next field day. Uh, going to see energy productivity in action uh, and some site tours there. So look out for that one coming up uh, next week. Uh, otherwise, all that's left is to say uh, many thanks to our speakers once more. And uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. The recording and the presentation slides will be available uh, hopefully early next week. Uh, so for those of you, apologies if you had some technical issues joining uh, this afternoon, but you'll be able to review those slides and the um, and, and the presentation uh, uh, webinar recording early next week. Uh, but thank you all for joining us and uh, hope you have a, a very good afternoon.